Sorry. Um, it's hard to believe sometimes that mom has been gone for more than a year. I think of her often, and I miss making the daily phone call to fill her in on the latest happenings or just to talk about what bird I'd seen in my front bird feeder. As I have often reflected this year, I have realized how blessed I am. I'm going to cry. To have a mom that left me with so many happy memories. I have also been blessed that my mom loved to teach by word and action. I would like to tell you about four things that mom taught me. And I have props because my mother always had props. <laughs> And the first prop is a sticky note. Mom taught me the importance of prayer. Um, she would write names on scraps of paper or sticky notes, so she would not forget to pray for the urgent needs of those around her. If you're here today, chances are good that your name was on one of those sticky notes. She knew that her God was a prayer answering God. She had seen amazing answers to prayer, even from childhood. Many of you have heard the story of Grandma's doll. I didn't bring it, sons, because you don't like the way it looks. <laughs> um, many of you have heard the story of Grandma's doll and how God answered and helped her and her family in their time of need. Many times through the years here in Guli, they saw God answer prayer and provide. My next prop is a canning jar, and um, I'm sorry, it's not full of beans. It should be full of beans. <laughs> um, Mom taught me about perseverance. Um, my dad loved to garden, and green beans seemed to go really well in Gooley River. I don't know. We always had a huge pile on our table, and it seemed like an impossible task to take the ends off, snap them, and preserve all those beans. Um, I don't remember Mom ever complaining about it, and we would work together little by little, one handful at a time, and um, the pile would get smaller and smaller. Mom would stay up late into the night processing all those jars in the canner, usually reading a book, <laughs> while she waited for them to be done. I remember in later years when I felt overwhelmed by the enormity of tasks that awaited me, she would say, just do the next thing. Um, the next thing Mom taught me was the most important thing in life, was knowing Jesus. So this is one of the Bibles that Mother has worn out. You can see that um, the spine is broken and it's, it was up on the table. You can look at it later. It's full of notes, full of notes. She taught me the most important thing was knowing Jesus. She read her Bible every day. And a hymn that she had taped to the closet door in her room was, I need thee every hour. And I'm going to get Werner to read the words, <laughs> because I'm going to cry. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee every hour, stay thou nearby. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. I need thee every hour, in joy or pain. Come quickly and abide, or life is vain. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior, I come to thee. This was true in her daily life, all through the years. She knew that she really needed the Lord's help for each day. My children and grandchildren have likely seen this pillow, and I think some of you ladies that have done vacation out of school in the past <laughs> will remember these pillows. Um, what Another thing Mother taught me was she wanted children to know Jesus. She showed me how important it was for children to know Jesus by getting up early on Sunday mornings, taking me in the station wagon, and driving around Gooley River, picking up kids and bringing them back to Sunday school. She spent hours planning her lessons so that God's truth would come alive to them. She taught us how important it was to use God's word and wanted a verse on every craft. 
so that God's word would be in their homes, reaching all who saw it. My mother was not perfect, but she knew a perfect Savior who she trusted as her Savior. Her greatest joy would be for you to love and trust him too. Now one of you is going to have to come. <laughs> My sister used this for her props. I'm going to prop myself. <laughs> Last year at Mom's funeral, this is this is what I this is what I wrote. But I feel more emotional this year, seeing all of your faces, because she loved you all very much, and you should have been there at that time. But we're very grateful that you could be here today. And that some of my children that were not here last year could be here today, and some of Becky's and Arnie's. So I'm just going to read what I wrote last year. Many poems and words of praise have been written about mothers, but I think song from Proverbs 31 says it best. Who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. She looks well to the ways of her household and doesn't eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. As a mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother, she was all of these. Only in illness were her hands stilled from my earliest memories, her hands were busy, loving, serving, and caring for the needs of others. And cooking. Boy, did she cook. She exampled generosity and kindness to the end. She not only taught us about Jesus, she lived him. Gossip was never a part of her speech, or anger, or foul language, or complaining. If she became cross because she was exhausted or stressed, she immediately apologized. My mama led me to Jesus when I was three years old, and I will thank her for her. I will thank the Lord for her forever and praise him. These last couple of weeks before she died, I have to change that. The last couple of weeks before our praying mother was now confined to bed in extreme pain, she often drifted from conversation with us to conversation with Jesus. Praying was not a to-do. It was just an integral part of her life. She loved the Lord, his word, our father, and we her children and our darlings in that order, and it showed. She showered love and kindness on those around her wherever she lived. Her caregivers wept at her suffering and passing. She loved on them too, often spoke to them about Jesus and prayed for them and their families. Mama loved to read, but she always set aside any book that turned smutty. She was a good example to me that way. Mama put a lot of miles on her Volkswagen Jetta after Daddy died, visiting family in the States and with us in BC. Usually she had a grandchild or two along on her adventures. Mama loved to picnic even in winter. She'd dig a spot out of the snow, build a fire, put on the coffee pot, and open the hamper. Her adventures were fun, but seldom cost money unless it included gas money, ice cream, or coffee. <laughs> I don't remember Mama complaining about the hard, endless farm work, the household tasks, family duties, and ministry responsibilities that were all cumulative. She just did it all as unto the Lord, and that's how she admonished us to live. Mama loved and cherished her grandchildren and continued to earnestly pray for them to love Jesus. That's my grandson chattering out there. Every day she prayed through her family, we will miss her, those fervent prayers, also. The baton has been passed on. Oh, to be half the woman of God she was. Not perfect, mind you, but forgiven. And I have to tell you something that happened. In the last week of her life, she was in an extreme amount of pain. And the caregivers came to turn her in bed and to clean her up. And after they were done, she was laying there on her back with her eyes shut. And I leaned over her and I said, Mama, are you okay? And she said, yes, I'm forgiven. So, so, 
Those were about the last words she said to me. A life well lived. Mm -hmm. She loved and lived well. Mm -hmm. <coughs> sisters have said, um, already quoting from <clears throat> Proverbs 31, the poem in the last chapter of Proverbs on the uh, virtuous woman, uh, verse 28, if I, my writing is poor, says that her children arise up and call her blessed, and that's what we're doing. So, um, our, both of our parents left us a wonderful heritage. Everybody gets something. You know, even people who have a lousy upbringing from their perspective will have lots of pain. It's rare to find a child that hates, absolutely despises their parents. And everybody has that soft connection in their lives. And um, so I'm just giving my little perspective of my mom. <clears throat> I have seven things here. And by the way, this is not what I said a year ago, four months. Um, because I have old person brain and I didn't bring my notes, A, and B, uh, I can't remember what I said. <laughs> so this is all fresh stuff, <laughs> or I have to write down new notes. So, uh, number one, my mom was always organized. In fact, in this uh, little thing you've got in front of you, there's a photocopy of her funeral message that she insisted I preach back in the day. She, she had it all planned. She writes it down to what the, old, you know, the kid was supposed to say. You know, she didn't trust me, I guess. But. <laughs> anyway, everybody that knew her realized that Lila Cloth was an organized person. You know, um, she, uh, she actually went through, and it was probably a self-defense mechanism back in the time because she she and my dad had been married 42 years when he passed in 91, and uh, <clears throat> and they went through, uh, it would be fair to say, almost hell and high water together because he was hard to live with, and they moved, I don't know, over 21 times in their marriage, um, uprooted, like, lock, stock, and barrel, traveling in old vehicles, never had a new vehicle, I don't think. And, and they just had a lot of problems and difficulties, and we got through that. So in the first year after Dad passed, she was still living in the farmhouse, and, and uh, she spent a whole year going through all the family papers. And she was the clock and Mao family historian. So she had boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff. She actually printed at least one big, thick history of her mom's clan going back hundreds of years. And, um, so that, she was a historian. She actually uh, joined up with my dad's <clears throat> next brother, Earl. I don't know what year it was, but probably early 80s, and they went on a road trip all the way to Connecticut and down into uh, Washington, D.C., and all through the eastern seaboard looking for clocks in, in cemeteries and stuff and tabulating all the information. Which is just illustrating the fact that she was uh, very dedicated to... Um, to be an organized. So she spent a whole year going through all that family stuff, threw most of it out, saved the essence. Elizabeth has most of what's left. Um, and um, the rest of us have bits and pieces. Um, 
The next year, the second year, she moved out of the farmhouse into the cabin next door and she spent every day, five days a week, maybe six sometimes, up in the office, up in the dormitory, and she went through 42 years worth of records from their churches, everywhere they went, and Thames Valley Bible College, the first ministry they started. Carol graduated from that place, I don't know what years, but it was before 67, because that's when it closed down. And then got married, brought Werner down to Northland. They, he graduated from Northland Bible College. And so they, that all those decades of, of paperwork, she saved all those records, and she summarized it all, and, um, <laughs> and uh, so anyways, the one thing that just sticks in my mind, my mother was such an organized person, I guess I got a little bit of that. Number two, she was always, dad's helped me and partner. Um, they um, don't, I'll, I'll just be real transparent here, I don't think my folks had a real happy marriage. That sounds shocking to you, real, but I heard an argument. They didn't know I was listening, but they were up in the bedroom having to hash it out. The only time I ever heard them fight, and it wasn't a public thing, but he was saying, you take the kids and leave, and I'm going to stay here with this ministry. I was kind of shaken to the core, but, um, and my father, as most of you know, was a visionary. He was a prophet type guy. He was truly a man of faith. I didn't get any of those traits, hardly. And uh, he could just envision something, and then make a great starter and then get it going and keep it going. You know. And uh, he was a little rough around the edges on relationships and he wasn't a team builder and that kind of showed up over after 30 years. And I often wondered, like, why do we have so many, so many of these problems? But the point is, is that behind the scenes, that woman there, she, uh, she stuck by him in the thick and the thin of it all. And uh, <clears throat> she was a peacemaker. Uh, she was, she, I'm like my mom, I like to make friends with people, I like to solve problems, conflict bothers me, and that was my mom, and Becky and I in particular, I don't know about Alice, I think she's a little bit more of a problem maker, she's, <laughs> <laughs> she's more like my dad, the visionary, but uh, Becky and I are a lot like my mom in the, in the sense that we like to try to fix things, you know, when people are mad. And, uh, she truly wasn't a complainer, and um, and she, uh, you know, worked worked like a dog. Honestly, just my dad would fill the sink with uh, thirty newly butchered chickens with all their feet on and their heads, and you know, and that represented several hours more of work at seven o'clock at night or whatever. Butchering in the fall, you know, all this animal guts and body parts all over the place, and everybody that came in from the barn, all these barn helpers that showed up here 40 years later to celebrate, you know, they brought their dirty old boots in there, stuck it in the kitchen, and you know, there's that aroma over by the door of the kitchen. And she never complained about that kind of stuff, but she just tolerated it and went on. What? Oh, maybe that's where the migraines came from. Third thing I remember about my mom is that she was a master teacher. Becky's already pointed this out. And uh, she obviously learned the lessons better than I did because I don't have any props. But, uh, but uh, she got a Bachelor of Arts in college as a condition of marriage to my father, my grandmother. Her, her mom said, you can't marry my daughter unless she goes to college. And um, so they did, out in California. And because of that education, it was my mother that developed and taught the pedagogy at Northland Bible College, Thames Valley Bible College, uh, child evangelism, Sunday school administration. She, uh, everything I know about teaching little kids, which I can, and primaries, and then elementary and junior, or junior and elementary, and right up to teen, young teens and teens, everything I know today about teaching kids, I learned from my mom. She was a master teacher. She was really good at it. And many of you are teaching Sunday school still today in whatever churches you are. And those of you who had anything to do with Northland Bible Chapel and College probably got a lot of that from Mrs. Clark. So and one key lesson that I've used all the time, being a father and grandfather, 
and if I'm hanging around your kids, I'll use it on your kids. And that is learn how to divert kids from getting further into trouble so you don't have to beat on them, right? Like divert their attention. She was a master of diversion. Now, I learned that from my mom. So anyways, if you, if you want hints and tips, some see me after because I learned that from my mom. Um, she was a prayer warrior. Um, very often I would catch my mother at the kitchen table with the Bible open, that Bible, or the one I have at home, the green one. She wore out two black Bibles and I got the green one. We kind of split that up. And, and uh, she'd have a prayer list. She'd have her pen. She'd have that half a cup of coffee and she'd be going through her list. And I'm sure every person in this room was on it. If she knew you, you were on her list. So we have a lot to be thankful for, for people who pray for us. Uh, she was a student of scripture. Now, Becky and Alice have both kind of alluded to this already, but <clears throat> the last three days of her life up in uh, Mapleview, the Gooley River section of the old folks' home, she, she was basically comatose. Uh, her body had just gone so far that she, they were had, on, had her on elevated pain meds and she couldn't, she never talked for the last three days. So we just took turns, you know, shifts, and we would sit with her. And uh, <clears throat> so one day I was, I, I don't know if it was uh, in the evening, I was kind of bored looking for something to do, and and I looked at, I looked, see her bed was here, and right behind her, over by the window, the wall, the interior court wall, there was a bookshelf, and uh, she had a whole stack of Bibles there, and New Testaments. And so just out of like, I got nothing else to do, I opened the top, took the top one off, and I started leafing through it, I was curious about the notes and stuff. Put it down, I went through the next one, and these Bibles are getting progressively older, so the one I got, I think it's 1968, I think there was one in the early 60s, and that one is a 1951 version. That's the one they came out of Dallas Seminary with. And she, my mother wore all three of those Bibles, and there may have been another one. But then it started to dawn on me, like, I can't believe the notes in this book. And I started going back through it again. And then I picked all of those Bibles up, and I flipped page by page. There was not a page, hardly, in three Bibles that didn't have notes in it. That was, she was a student of the Word. God honors his word above his name, Psalm 138 too. He, honor, he exalts his own word above his name. And I believe that God takes pleasure in anybody that gets serious with the Bible. And I'll just say this as a point, like I'm a preacher, so here it goes. Right? If you claim to be a Christian and you don't read your Bible, and if you don't study your Bible, you are dishonoring God. You, you're misfocused. And I got to tell you that I took this lesson to heart. So 13 years ago, I still lived in Goody River. I realized that after 30 some years in ministry, I had never studied the Bible word for word myself. I read the Bible a few times, but never studied it. Now it's a whole different thing to sit down, you know, and read when, you know, oh, I've got 30 minutes, I got to read a chapter of the Bible. And I started studying in Genesis 1, every chapter of the Bible, word for word, figure out the logic, figure out the lesson, and write a devo on it. And so I'm now at Isaiah chapter 56, at 700, and I don't know, a little over, you know, 60% of the way through the book. I'm not going to live long enough. We're going to get raptured here pretty soon. <laughs> but you know something, at least I can stand before the Lord and say, you know, I honor your word. I I've spent time there. I've listened to what you said and had written down. So anyway, I got, I got the example from both my parents, and, um, but I had to make my own choice, too, to follow that example and be a student of the Word. Um, she loved her independence. That's one thing about my mom. She talked about an independent woman. In fact, I'm quite con convinced that her independence killed her. I, or, that had a big part in contributing to it because she would go to Valley Village in the last couple of years when she lived out at the farm. And she knew she was getting ready, you know, to move and downsize. So she would buy all the old suitcases and and she would fill her little Jetta with these suitcases, drag them home, and take them out into the garage, and then she'd put, you know, all of her sewing in this one and her craft stuff in this one and you know, her cl winter clothes in this one and whatever. Like she just had them all labeled, nice organized, and she had them on this great big um, we call it a shelf at the back of the garage, and, and uh, 
And she was too proud to like call me up and get me to come over from Pine Shores Road to lift that thing. And she started lifting all that heavy stuff by herself. And she traumatized the, her muscles and her jelly head. I would call it osteoporosis, plus she had the curvature of the spine, scoliosis. And anyway, the doctor finally told her two years into it that, um, yeah, you, you did something, you did it to yourself. Just lifting stuff you shouldn't have lifted. And so, anyway, she ended up with a spine like this, pushed her guts out, you know, bent her over. Like she was in extreme pain. And uh, it's because of that independent spirit, she didn't, that didn't like to ask for help. On the positive side, uh, she was uh, 30 years a widow, minus six months. And uh, one time, I was kind of feeling for my mom, and I said, Mom. So I, I kind of like, you know, uh, took my life in my hands and I said, Mom, listen to me. I love you. You know I love you. Can I set you up with real Sedolia? <laughs> <laughs> so Guido Sedolia was uh, by this time a widow from the Gospel Hall, you know, a great evangelist and insanely well known. And uh, very one of the few times my mother ever got spitting mad at me. <laughs> She said, why would I ever get married again? <laughs> she loved her independence. <laughs> so, uh, but she would, uh, many times she demonstrated that she would drop everything and drive to New Brunswick, take him already out to Bible College, or down to Missouri to her clan. Uh, so I, my dad died on the 1st of October, 91, and I think five days later, her mom of 102 years of age died. And uh, she toughed it all out. She just like, she's grieving, but she went down and buried her mom and then came back and got right busy. And uh, she took, she went to Florida for our kids' graduation from Pennsylvania Christian College. She drove up to BC, I don't know how many times. She just loved that, that little Jetta. And um, so that independence. And the last thing I just want to say here, because I don't want to dominate too much, but um, my mother, towards the end, changed dramatically. I'm just telling Arlene here that the older we get, the circle of our opportunity and the circle of our daily connections to every other human being on the planet, our ability to function shrinks and it shrinks and it shrinks to the point where you can't travel anymore, you lose your license, that was hard for her, right? And you end up in a box. That's, that's how big that is when you're dying. Right? A box. Right? Now every one of us is somewhere closer to center than the others, right? Right? Uh, do you feel it? Do you feel your, your world shrinking? And that's by divine design. And my mom's world shrunk. She couldn't drive. She couldn't go anywhere unless somebody picked her up. And then it got too painful for that. Then COVID hit. You couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't do anything. You couldn't visit. Um, and um, so she was limited to her room, she said to us when we first put her in there. This is such a, a very, this is a really nice prison. <laughs> and, 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 but it's, to my knowledge, it's the only room on that floor, maybe in the whole building, that was completely covered with decorations, Bible verses, plaques, gospel signs. When those nurses and caregivers walked into that room, they were walking into, you know, God's den or something. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, she spoke her mind. She lost her filter at the end there. And so if you needed to hear truth, you were going to hear it. And you did. And she made enemies and she made friends. And, and uh, I have no doubt that there may have been somebody that got saved on that staff, you know, through my mom's influence. She uh, loved, focused on heaven. That's where it came down to. I'm going to heaven. I heard the same words from my mom's mouth. You know, one of the last things she ever said to me was, I'm forgiven. Now, I know that that means that she struggled with things because you don't talk about that unless you've got problems. But she didn't talk about those problems. It was her and God, right? And so, okay, preacher, application number two. Are you forgiven today? Can you say that with absolute certainty? Are you worried about your sins? Are you worried about being ignored? There's no need for being worried about it. You can get it settled. 
My mom was so she focused on the bottom line with everybody is Jesus. If you got Jesus, you're good. Right? He that has the Son has life. And he that has not the Son of God does not have life. We're condemned unless you put your faith in Jesus Christ. So, anyway, that's what I remember about my mom. Some of you know that I drive a car in town uh, as a share ride service, and I often pick up staff and take them to Napleview, and I'll ask the question, did you know 11 o'clock? Oh, it was always positive. They all remember her, and the impact that she had was very, very positive. Thank you, Steve and, and Alice, and thank you for sharing this morning, this afternoon. I'm going to ask, I don't know who's doing the special music, but would you come to um, so in your intro, the words to this song are there, and um, we really like how singing this because obviously we haven't practiced. <laughs> that wasn't unusual, and I would be really better than mom. She said, "Could you sing one sound So. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
want to say, uh, I'm going to do a little message here. Uh, and again, I already said it's a different message than one I, because I forgot. But, you know, it's a little different. But after this, um, we have people that go all the way back to, like, I don't know, before the dinosaurs here. 1960. <laughs> and we didn't get here until three years after the Normans moved and moved here over in 1965. 65. And, uh, you know, and then like the Josephs and uh, the Simpsons and like all the Breckenridges. There's just lots of the old clan I represent here today. So, anyways, we're going to open the mic here, or you don't have to come out here if you're shy, but please stand to your feet if you have a memory or something that you've been blessed with, you know, through the ministry of my folks here over the years, and the other staff that joined them in the ministry here, and uh, please be thinking about sharing something. It always makes this the best, the best celebration, okay? So my mom wanted me to, back in the day, you know, back at the home where we had the funerals, she said, this is what I want you to preach from, John 17, 20 to 26. Jesus prayed for me, she wrote, I will see his glory, I will be with him, and I have lived in his love. So join me. There it is. Now they'll give you the expanded version. <laughs> but that was what she wanted me to say. And you know, John 17, Jesus did pray for all of those that would come to faith in him. Now I had forgotten that message, and uh, so I made up a whole new one. So anyways, I have a little bit of stuff to say here today. I'm impressed as a Christian, as a student of the Bible, having lived not as long as some of the oldies here, but you know, I have lived a few decades that, and I've interacted with people of different faiths and different religions that I am absolutely convinced today that the faith of my father and my mother, which they got from others down through the year, my dad got his faith from his buddy in boot camp on the way to Guam in the Second World War. That's where he found Jesus. And he was raised in the Methodist church back in the mountains of Colorado. And uh, he didn't get Jesus in that church. My mom was raised as a preacher's kid, and uh, she heard it from infancy, as did I and my sisters. But not everybody gets this message the same way. So I don't think that we as Christians need to feel badly or to second guess or whatever. Um, anything the Bible teaches, we have the best death doctrine going on. There is an original religion in the world that teaches such wonderful truths that Christianity teaches about death, dying, and living again in eternity. And uh, there's nothing better than what the Bible says. And um, <coughs> I heard a joke one time, so I'm going to try to say this. I'm really bad at jokes, but this, uh, this bartender had a parrot, and it knew how to talk. And it was in that bar for years. And then somehow that building changed hands, and the preacher ended up with this building. And he ended up with, have you anybody heard this one? And the, and the preacher ended up with the same old parrot. And so anyway, the first Sunday, you know, he opened the doors, and all these people come in, and the parrot's standing in the corner, and goes, ah, you know, different building, same old crowd. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I know that, yeah, the people from before were a bunch of drinkers, and, Whole life, and like I'm not, that's not the point. The point is that there's a lot of old people from way back when here today, and we have a new crowd here today too. So we join together. <laughs> back in back in April, when uh, we stood at the Good River Cemetery and put my mom's casket down on the ground, uh, it was still a month away from planting season. But it was a really nice warm day. It was beautiful. And uh, it, it, you could have planted it that day if you wanted. In fact, I'm sure a lot of people already had starters going. And now, 14 months later, my mother's body, I'm sure, is corrupted in the grave. That's stage one, is putting it in the ground. And stage two is waiting for an indeterminate period of time until stage three, the sound of the Savior who will call all people from the grave. And there will be eternal fruit. And that's the kind of the gist of this message. I mean, I'm going to shorten it up because I don't want to take too much time. But 
You know, the scriptures actually teach this. In John 12, Jesus had just raised Lazarus from the dead. And he said, basically, you know, if a, corn, a piece of corn, a corn, kernel of corn, uh, if it doesn't fall on the ground, and if it doesn't rot in the ground, it will never bring forth fruit. Jesus used the planting and plants and harvesting and reaping metaphor many times in his parables. Matthew 13, the sower puts the seed out, some of it falls on the hardened path, some of it falls over here in the thorns, some in the rocks, and, you know, some in prepared soil. Three of those scenarios that he pictured describe plants coming up from the seed of the gospel. Two of those plants bore no fruit. The last one that fell on good prepared soil produced much fruit. So it's not, okay, you know, I tried this one time. I took a potato out of my hand and called him Young Died. He was a potato farmer. I thought it was entirely appropriate. I had a, an old, wrinkly, rotten potato <laughs> with eyes coming out of it, and I had it in my pocket. And Wes, the Pedro, and uh, Dwayne Tuckett were my two students at the time, and they were sitting in the back row, and there were only five people that all called me on the funeral. And I pulled that potato out of my pocket, and those guys broke, broke up. They were almost laying on the floor holding their guts laughing. I thought it was entirely appropriate because our body is like an old wrinkly old potato, you know, going in the ground. Looks like nothing. There, all the beauty's gone, right? But there is incipient life there, placed by God in the DNA of that potato. That if, it, if and only if you put it in the dirt and it gets watered, will that potato bring forth life? you know, months, weeks later. And that's what happens to every one of us. There's not a person in this room that isn't going to go through the planting process if Jesus doesn't come back first. We're all on our way. Your body is like a seed. You're growing a seed. And I can tell from some of you it's getting wrinklier. <laughs> and you know, it's like the difference between, you know, fresh, fresh nice, round, firm, soft, juicy peas when you first take them out of the garden, right? Just wait for four months, you know, and that, that little seed, if you save it to plant for the next year, it's hard, you know, it's lost its flavor, it don't look like anything you'd want to put in your mouth, right? But it's, it's in that state that when you put it in the ground, it doesn't matter what it looks like later, there's the time passes and it brings forth fruit. Jesus used this Every human life is like a plant. It produces a seed, one seed, which gets planted at death. And uh, after it's planted, it later brings forth fruit. And Jesus taught this about himself. He said, I'm, that's what's going to happen to me. I have to die. I have to be planted in burial so that I can be resurrected bodily from the grave to get eternal life. In 1 Corinthians 15, I'm not going to read these passages, but there's an extent. The whole chapter is called the Resurrected Chapter in the Bible. And there's a section towards the end of that 15th chapter that talks about how that... Here's, here's the reality of life. God has made, has made human beings to go through two phases of existence. In this life, it's the natural body. And the next one is the spiritual body. For Christians, I'm just talking about Christians specifically. And a natural body cannot go to heaven. Flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of heaven. You must be planted in the ground before you can be resurrected from the ground and have a spiritual body that is fit for heaven. Our God made a beautiful world. This is such a wonderful location. I'm very happy with all the people that worked so hard to make this new building here. What a pretty spot, right? God made a beautiful world, and do you think that heaven isn't going to be even better? Really, if you think about it, it's going to be better. And so, always the natural body first, then the spiritual body. And, and um, the, at death, the natural body is planted, uh, because it can't go to heaven, it has to go through that uh, degeneration, and then whatever, <coughs> either resurrection or rapture, to be able to go to heaven. Second Corinthians 5, the moment my mother died last April 21? 
It was very, um, the moment her body let go of its soul and spirit, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And God makes a house not made and fashioned by human hands. There's no human engineers and blueprints that, that came up with that. That's a divine design, that temporary spiritual body that houses you, the real you, while your body begins to molder according to the second law of thermodynamics in the ground. And Christians that read the Bible know this. And so, like, this is a, my, my mother never had a better day than the day she died and went to heaven. The day you die is the best day of your life. If you're a believer. Right? And so you go to be in the presence of the Lord. And, and um, immediately upon death, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, Paul was trying to comfort the Thessalonian Christians. They had been lied to. There was false doctrine being brought in from the outside. And he said, Look, remember what I had told you. Um, not, if not all of us believers are going to die and sleep, as it were. Like death for a Christian is basically like going to sleep because you're going to wake up. And it's going to be better when you wake up. And, and he said, uh, those that God, that uh, I have to read this to get it exactly right. First Thessalonians, this is such a wonderful passage. First Thessalonians 4.13. Concerning those who have died, Christians who are asleep, don't, don't be sorrowing like people who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which are sleeping in Jesus will God bring with him. You have to be alive for God and the person of Jesus Christ to bring, for him to bring you with him. So where, where are people whose bodies are sleeping in the ground? They are with Jesus because Jesus will bring those people, their soul and their spirits with him. This puts to death soul sleep doctrine. No, no, your soul doesn't go in the ground with your body to sleep until the resurrection. The moment you die, you go, your soul and spirit go to be the real you is with Jesus. When Jesus comes back, he brings all of those souls and spirits with a temporary spiritual body with him and listen to what happens. It says, um, this we say unto you by the word of the Lord that we which are alive and remain, the living Christians that haven't died before Jesus comes back shall not precede those that have died and who are asleep. The Lord himself is sent from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. The people like my mom and my dad, and all of your, all of you who have loved ones who have died, who are believers in Christ, they're going to come up first. It's called the first resurrection several times in the New Testament, First Corinthians, Revelation. First resurrection, resurrection is eternal life. And then, after all those people get re, re the, you know, those old bodies get the, turns, the natural body turns into a spiritual body, gets re, reunited with soul and spirit, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wow. Right? He comes back seven years later, sets up his kingdom on earth, you know, rules and reigns with all power and glory and honor. The Lord's prayer will be fulfilled at the second coming of Jesus Christ. We pray, may your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It ain't being done today, but someday it's going to be. Right? And you and I, who are with Jesus, are going to witness it. We're going to be there with Jesus, King Jesus. Awesome. Like what a future we have, right? And so, anyways, I'll quit. I really would like to hear from you, but we have, that's that's what's going to happen to your body. Your plant, we're withering away. It's going to turn into a seed. It's going to stay there for a while. God knows, you know, he's in charge of all the DNA and the chemistry and the physics and everything else. He's going to make it happen. Jesus Christ comes and the voice of Christ is going to raise every dead person that ever died, Christian and non-Christian, from the grave, just two different times. And all of us who love the Lord are going to be dead. That's the beginning of like, something awesome. Right? Okay, so please, uh, please feel free to stand and share. Oh, <laughs>
I'm in charge here now, Steve. <laughs> let's, uh, let's all stand up and sing His Name is Wonderful. You probably know this by heart. This is a song that we often sing with Blanca. So sometimes <laughs> someone else. Okay. 
So, uh, some of you may not recognize me or not know me, Kim O'Lor. Uh, I was try thinking of trying to think of a memory that I can focus on, but there's just too many because I've known Grandma Clock my entire life. And I was an honorary mother of the Clock Clan. Still kind of. Um, Grandma Clock was my Sunday school teacher, a VBS teacher, a wellness teacher, pretty much any kind of teacher you can think of. And she did like to use props. My favorite prop she would bring would be her fresh meat bread. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can make it just like that. I don't know why. But there's lots of memories with her. Um, I remember going to the cab cottage to have tea with her or play a card game, any kind of game. She always has something to do. She smacked me a couple times saying, don't act like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work, I still act. <laughs> uh, like all of us would run around the fields chasing the cows, get told not to. Now, there's not just one memory you can choose with Grandma Clock, because she's pretty much in all of them. Thank you, Kim. Um, I've done a lot of funerals where we have open mic, and uh, we've had some difficulty from time to time where I had to come and step on someone's toe and say, time to land the bird. <laughs> so please come and share with that thought in mind. And uh, yeah, who else? Sure. I scared you all away, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm one of the old clan. Yep. <laughs> uh, going back 50 years. In fact, uh, I first started coming to Northland when I was 10, and then uh, in, in this next this next month or this month coming up in July when I started when I came to VBS, and I thought this was a really cool place to be. You know, you get to ride horses and ride carts and do the treasure hunt and run all over the property. And uh, when I watched Northland evolve from uh, meeting in the kitchen of the farmhouse, in my classroom was in the barn. Until it got too cold and we moved down to Simpson's house for the winter and had our Sunday school there. And then the next spring, the chapel was ready for, for, for use. So I pretty much been there from beginning of Northland just within three years of, of coming here. And Mrs. Clock, I do remember, you know, the filters started coming off long before she went into the home. <laughs> I remember telling uh, Brenda one time, Brenda, when she first got her hair dyed, she goes, you used to be so beautiful. <laughs> I was regularly reminded how fat I was. <laughs> that was Mrs. Clock. Uh, and yeah, one of, one of the things she taught me was how to teach. You know, Steve said she was a master teacher. Uh, even today, uh, a lot of stuff that I, when I prepare, uh, I wrote 10 years ago, I wrote a series of Bible study guides. And I basically followed her line of thinking the whole way through as I put them together. So she was uh, quite a remarkable woman and always had something to say. Someone else? Yes, John. Yes. If we had a wireless mic, we'd pass it around, but you have to come forward. I'm sorry. Yeah, she meant everything uh, to us, you know, as, as a church. And she poured her life, you know, into everybody that she ever met. And uh, there's, uh, like you say, Kim, there's so many memories uh, that you could say about her. But, um, one of the memories, uh, several memories. One thing that she did say, and that it was kind of weird that she said it, but, and I don't know what she was thinking. She said, but don't put too much uh, stock in people. She said, because people will always disappoint you. And I don't know who she had in mind when she told me that, but. Uh, 
maybe that was her life, you know, that she was a woman that lived with disappointments too, and happiness. Um, I remember one time when we were doing some haying, she asked me if I wanted a pop because she saw that it was really hot. But it was just typical of hers. She went and she got me a pop. <laughs> A two-liter bottle, <laughs> like I would need all of that. But one of the funniest uh, memories that I have of her is uh, when we first got saved. There was a fella that lived on the other side of Gooley near us, uh, Mr. Dowson, Harry Dowson. He was 93 when he passed away. He was really old when uh, he was coming to church, and I would bring him to church with Bart every Sunday evening. And he went to the United Church on, on Sunday morning. But I don't know if you remember this uh, story or not, but Harry loved to sing. And uh, ivory palaces was something that he always sang. So when he, I think I was chairing the meeting, he said, I, he put his hand up, he said, I'd like to sing. I thought, okay, here comes ivory palaces again. But it wasn't. He got up to the front and he dragged the chair up to the front with him and he put the chair in the, in the, at the front facing the audience and then he called uh, Mrs. Clock up. I always called her Lila. She said that I was the only one that ever called her my name. But. So he called Lila up and uh, she sat in the chair facing us and he sang her a song. And uh, it was, uh, I, I, I forgot the words, but it was uh, Mrs. McCray, old Mrs. McCray was the name of the song. And I don't know exactly how it goes, but Dr. Clock was in the back, sitting uh, where he normally sat there to overlook uh, everything. And Harry started to sing this song uh, to Lila. And as he's singing the song, he's talking about her old gray hair, and he takes his hand and he's sweeping her hair back, like that on her head. And she's just loving it. And, uh, but I could see that she was always focused on Dr. Clark. <laughs> she was waiting for the smoke to... You know, <laughs> and then, uh, then he takes her hand, he talks about her old wrinkled brow and her old wrinkled hand, and he's taking her hand and he's, he's rubbing the wrinkles off of her forehead like that, and then he takes her hand and he bends down and he kisses her. And, my eyes immediately went out. I thought he was going to come up. But I think that uh, your dad was actually jealous. <laughs> but uh, she took it all in good stride, you know, and uh, that, was, uh, that was just her. She went, anything went, I think, with uh, the class. <laughs> One of my memories of Mrs. Clark. She, uh, I happened to be born in Germany. I was six months old when I came to Canada, so as far as I was concerned, I was a Canadian as everyone else, but uh, her father was German. And she told me a story of how her father would stop along the way and buy an ice cream and eat it in front of the children and not give them ice cream. And I think she was trying to tell me don't be like that. <laughs> because I was a bit rough around the edges as a young married man myself and uh, had young kids and was probably a little more strict than she liked. I don't know. But she's, I think she perceived me going in that direction and because I was German and she associated me with her family. I think she lost that perspective of me as she got to know me more and more. Other, other individuals? Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't much like playing phone, but just wanted to, uh, to uh, share uh, that when you mentioned uh, Stephen about the suitcases, she takes me up to the farmhouse after she says, Hello, look what I've been doing with these suitcases, and showing me all what she had accomplished for that week or that month or whatever. It was, you know, and I can see how she was uh, very organized, as you said. Lila was an encourager. Uh, we have candy man in this church, and, and it was Lila that got Bob started on that. Mm -hmm. uh, Christmas time, we were over at the farmhouse, and it was Arlene and Stephen's kids that were filling up the candy bags for, for 
Christmas trees for the kids. So the next year, by the set five, I was to get some candy for the Christmas tree. And then after that, we kind of just stuck it over, and, and that was cool. But she was an encourager. And if you had a talent, she could see it before you did. And so, like, she just had a, a way of getting you to do things that, you know, that you might not have thought that you could do or wanted to do, but, you know, she was a real encourager. And I'll tell you the one piece of advice that I'll never forget, which really isn't spiritual at all, but we were here putting down chickens and turkeys and stuff and processing them there. And when you say about the smell in the house when they come in, with them, well, you know, like that smells when you're doing that. And I'm, I'm with Lila. And Miss Rachel, she says, I'll tell you a secret. She says, breathe through your teeth. Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I didn't know Lyra really well, but when I started going to Northland, I got to know her family quite well and attached to them quite quickly. And I remember when she started not being able to go downstairs, she'd be at the top of the, sit in the chair at the top of the church. And then she'd see me and then I'd, you'd see near the end, if she made it to the end, sometimes she didn't at the end, and she'd be going like this to me and go over and she'd go, I was praying for you to come back. You know, I was praying for you to come back. And as she got older than that, and um, I started being gifted working with the elderly that are 1992 and I do their hair and I find warts and because you're talking about the old rotten potato, I started seeing warts on people's faces. And I'm not a nurse like my sister, so I'd get a little nauseous if my cone hit one and something like that. So I pray, Lord, Lord, God, why when we get older, why do we have to have these warts and things? And the voice said to me, it was clear as that we have to work on our inner beauty. Mm -hmm. And Lila had inner beauty radiating radiating from her, and same as um, Irene Rust. I still see the same, the spirit. So as we're getting older and rotten, let's work on our inner beauty from the spirit that she, she had taught us. You're still beautiful, Candy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's been really interesting to hear about your mom and how organized she was and everything. And uh, she was doing that, getting all these those things ready to, to, you know, move to the next stage and everything. I don't know, I remember walking into Scripture Gifting Bookshop, great place in Canada. And uh, I, as I went up, she was at the counter and she called me over and I went over and she said, I just wanted to say thanks. And I said, oh, I couldn't think of anything, I hadn't been talking to her recently. She said, I've been, I've been going through a lot of things, um, you know, to get ready. I've just been going through, sorting through a lot. She said, I wanted to thank you for the really nice anniversary card you sent us for, and your dad had been already gone, and I, I kind of thought, oh. She said, well, and the reason why I'm doing that is because she said, this is it. I won't be thanking you for it anymore because it's all going out. <laughs> she really, when she put her mind to it, obviously, but... Hmm. I thought, you know, just in that one moment there, what a wonderful heart gift from the Lord for your mom, which is showing up with these people, that each person with her felt individually focused on and loved and cared about. That's amazing, and that was her. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say something. All right. Say something. Last chance. Yes. Nice. reached out and could get my dad's heart was Mrs. Clark. She told me this in the retirement home because now I'm old and I get to hear adult information. 
And she told me, because long time ago, when they used to have the, the college and all the kids were up there, and the water lines had frozen, and my parents heard about that. So that's how all the clocks and all the ones from Memphis and all over the place got a crash course on the Samana. Because my parents invited them all down to have saunas, so they used to come down in groups. The doctor missed the clock and, and everybody used to come down there. And, and I had no idea that Mrs. Clock took advantage of those times to talk to my dad. And a lot of people were kind of scared of my dad because he was, I mean, he was a funny guy and this and that, but when my dad meant business, he meant business. But she got through to him, and my dad shared a lot about the war and thing that, things that he went through in World War II. And it was her kindness and her softness that my dad would actually start going up to church and doing special things and stuff like that. And my dad ended up getting saved, and Tim baptized him in the, in the Gooby River. So there was me, Marley, Kenny, my brother Brian. My mom couldn't even speak English besides, hi, how are you? And she learned to speak English through her Bible, listening to Dr. Croc preach all the time. So they've been quite a, quite a blessing, and we sure do. Our, my whole family just loved and adored Mrs. Croc. Thank you. All right. Now the sharing doesn't have to stop uh, as we um, go on to the next part of our memorial, which is at the picnic. And we chose an outdoor picnic because that's what Mrs. Claude loved to do and be involved in. Um, continue to share with the Claude family here uh, your stories, your impressions, your memories, and I'm sure that would be a blessing to them. Let's, um, where's the bulletin? Let's conclude our service with a song. So apparently there is a rose and a salt and pepper shaker for each one of you. We got that many? Uh, well, for each family. Okay, one per family. All right. Let's stand up and sing um, Hallelujah, what a Savior, Man of Sorrows. It's on your hand out there.
So we thank you for that. We pray, Father, that as we uh, close this formal part of the service, that our fellowship may continue to be sweet. And we want to thank you for providing for us the food and the sustenance that we need. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Last verse. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransom hope to bring, then a new they song will sing. Hallelujah, what a Savior. One announcement, the Norland family is represented here today. And they are holding memorial service at Mountain View Baptist next Sunday at 2 p.m. So let's support them as members of our community and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. All right? All right. God bless you. You are dismissed from this. But please help yourself. We gave thanks for the food. And you can uh, help yourself to what's there. If you have things in your car yet that you want to bring up, join the potluck. Do so. And you can meet in here or outside under the canopy or wherever you'd like to go. Okay? Thank you for coming.